Dear Father God, we're living in the last days. And many of us aren't even acting like it. We get to church late. We don't commit ourselves to a study fellowship group. We don't bother sharing our faith with others. And we think Jesus is coming for us to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That won't happen that way. Father, if we're not wholly yours, we're not yours at all. That's what your word indicates. So, Father, give us Jesus. Give us the prophecies that point to Jesus. Lord, we live in an age when many Seventh-day Adventists believe that the prophecies are anachronistic. They're something that belong to another time. That kind of mentality would surely lead someone to be lost at the end. Help us to never go that way. Lord, we're going to open up Daniel 2, but we can't understand Daniel 2 without Jesus. So grant us the mind of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, the commitment of Jesus. Not just for our church, Lord, for Jesus. In his name, amen. C.S. Lewis in his Narnia series chose the figure of a strong lion named Aslan to represent the person of Jesus Christ. Dr. Richard Davidson, Theological Seminary, at time, from time to time, when we discover something new, chiastic or otherwise, he'll say, Mike, Aslan is not a tame lion. And he's referring to C.S. Lewis. A strong lion. A lion you cannot tame. He gets it, of course, from the lion of the tribe of Judah, the book of Revelation. When evil took over Narnia, the white witch brought the cold breath of winter to the enchanted realm of Narnia. Mr. Beaver shared with the boy Edmund an ancient oracle and prophecy in a little piece of rhyme that captures the hope of all true prophecy as it is found in Jesus. The beaver shared with Edmund this rhyming oracle. Wrong will be right when Aslam comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. You know, that kind of thing. He says again with a game, a long A sound. And it was something about that. When I was watching the, the movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, because I've been a C.S. Lewis fan in my life, that little thing stands out. It, it captures what prophecy is about. Prophecy is to bring us a future where wrongs are righted, where there's a new hope, where the spring is alive, when the winter ends and we live forever and ever and ever and ever. Is that a good thing? It's hugely important. I ask you today, why are we studying the Bible prophecies as Christians? I, I'm, in my experience as a pastor, I've been through an interesting journey in my ministry. I started out engaging the books of Daniel and Revelation dynamically within my congregation up in the Oakwood Church in Michigan. Many of the discoveries that I've worked for through the years came in small group, group Bible studies. And at that time, I felt in our church, our denomination, there was a keen interest in prophecy. And people would resonate with it, and obviously non adventists would resonate with it. I find that many non adventists are searching for answers and prophecies. But I have noticed over the years in our denomination, our culture, that there is a generation or two that has arisen that believes that somehow the prophecies are bad. That somehow they've hurt our church. That somehow they've robbed our church of its gospel message. And so they have couched the prophecies here, the gospel here, at war with each other. And I ask myself this question as I interact with these kind of people. Where is the fruit of this kind of thing? Are they working to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord? Or are they playing games in the church? Friends, God gave us the prophecies to prepare us and to prepare our children for the coming of Jesus Christ. Do you hear me? And I say that because I'm excited about that fact. If it weren't for the prophecies, I tell you right now, I would not be a Seventh-day Adventist. Because our right to the future, our charter is prophetic we have been given the third angel's message. The first and second was preached by the Millerites in the 1800s. The fourth angel comes after us. We are the third angel. And we are a people born on the wings of Bible prophecy. So why do we study prophecy? Do we study prophecy to look smart? 
I hope not. Most of us are not smart at all. I'm not, I'm not a genius. I'm just doing the best with what I have. Do we study Bible prophecy to know world events so we can invest our money better and hide in the woods from evil powers and be good preppers? Right? Do we? That won't work either. In the testing time, being a prepper is not your way out of end time events. Do we study Bible prophecy so we can know the future and nothing more than world events so we can be in tune? Is that why we do it? Let's pinch ourselves with the fact that the future doesn't matter if we're not in it. If we don't get to that glorious future, then all of our study of prophecy doesn't matter. Dear heart, God has given us Bible prophecy so we can be saved in Jesus Christ. He has given us a knowledge of the future so we can hook our cart to the Son of God and we can live vibrant lives that make a difference for the future. In the book of Revelation, you know, you go to the very end of the book, it says, the Spirit and the Bride say, come, let him who is thirsty come. In other words, the one who wants the things of God come. And then it says, take the water of life freely. The water of life. Have you ever been on a hot day when you were trying to cool down. In fact, it happened to me the other day. I got a text message from a young man who's been mowing my yard for two years during COVID. He says, I'm done. No more mowing. So I went out and bought a new mower. I had to. I got an ego mower. You ever hear of an ego mower? They're battery powered and the new ones come with a 10 amp battery. That battery did my entire yard, of course, with some help from me. And I got real hot because it was a hot day. And I noticed I was you know, suffering symptoms of heat e exhaustion. So I went in, took a shower, and I drank a lot of cool, refreshing water from my wife's water filter that she has put a few hundred bucks in to make sure we have the best water you can imagine. And there's nothing like water to cool you down when you're hot. Friend, we need the living water. The call comes from the future. Take the water of life without price. Perhaps the most basic of all Bible prophecies that calls us to the future is the one that's found in Daniel chapter 2. How many of you brought your Bibles to church this morning? We use slides, but I may cut them off if I don't see more Bibles opening up. Now, Daniel chapter 2 is recorded for us to understand in the latter days. How many of you believe we are living the latter days just from following the news and the headlines and the like? Well, that's not the best test, but it's a sure indicator. Isn't there a feeling that people can't fix the mess the world is in? That we are in over our heads in trouble right now in this world? Daniel 2 was written for the latter days. Daniel reveals a dream that contains the correct outline of all historical Bible prophecy that reaches from Daniel's day all the way down to the time of the end, the last days that we are living in right now. And Daniel 2 is not just about the king and his dream that needed to be understood back then by the king. Daniel 2 is about God and you and God's dream for your future and your life, your family's future, a life in a Torah kingdom, a Torah kingdom that will never, never, never end. And so Daniel 2 is about you. And so you must engage God when you read Daniel 2. Daniel 2 is about God's prophetic purpose for glorious future. Wrong will be right when Jesus comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. Daniel 2 and you. Every family should study the prophecy of Daniel 2 and understand it well because every family needs to be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you struggle with Bible prophecy a little bit? The honest thing. Stick your hands up there. Yep, I do, Pastor Mike. Now, here's how it works. I recommend the website angelsintheglen.org because there's no better way in the world, really, to get into Bible prophecy and understand it than that website. But having said that, the one prophecy that summarizes all of Bible prophecy in Daniel Revelation that's the simplest and easiest to understand is Daniel chapter 2. You start there. You don't start with calculus. You start with algebra or basic math. That's Daniel 2. And that's where we're at today. Daniel 2 and you is our prophetic and spiritual focus here this morning because we need to understand it. So take your Bibles and turn with me to Daniel 2 verse 1. Open it up. And as we examine this amazing prophecy of a metallic man, a mountain kingdom, and then a stone kingdom that follows in the latter days. Verse 1. In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Have you ever had a nightmare in your life? No, you never had a nightmare? How many of you had a recent nightmare in the last two weeks? Anybody here? What makes a nightmare go away? 
you wake up, that helps. If you don't wake up, you got a real nightmare, okay? <laughs> yeah, if you wake up, you're, you're doing better, okay? But doesn't it also help to know how to put it all together? Oh, it's just a dream. You ever say you saw that? Just a dream. Now, what if you believe your nightmare is true? Then you got a real problem. That's where Nebuchadnezzar is. His spirit was troubled. His sleep left him. Verse 2. Then the king commanded the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans he'd be summoned to tell the king his dream. So they came in and stood before the king, the think tank of ancient Babylon. And the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. The dream narrative in Daniel 2 starts in the second year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Daniel and his friends were captured and brought to Babylon just before and in the first year of his reign. And so this is the transition time that creates what history calls the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the New Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem in the summer of 605 B.C. And he had to return home when he learned that his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had just died. And so the conquest of Jerusalem had to be put off a little bit, but he took Daniel and his friends and he went back. King Nebuchadnezzar thus became, in the fall of that year, when Daniel and his friends arrived in Babylon, the new monarch of Babylon. In 603 B.C., the king was not just a warrior anymore. The king was the king of the entire realm. And that's a heavy load to have on, a, on shoulders when you were young and trying to, to figure things out. He was the king of Babylon. And he didn't have his wise father to help guide him through the woods. And you can bet your bullets there were people out there trying to shoot bullets, so to speak, and end his reign because a king who is new is often involved in intrigue. Nebuchadnezzar was afraid of court intrigue, the chance of some angry, evil man that he would try to take advantage of him, would take his life. And so he was looking over his shoulders, fearful early in his reign. When you fail as a king, you don't live long in a kingdom that worships power, that worships power and competence. If you're incompetent, if you don't show the right kind of power, in nature the weak die. And so the king was aware of this. Now verse 1 says his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. To solve the problem, King Nebuchadnezzar called the think tank of his father's kingdom of Babylon, the wise men, to provide some answers. There were astrologers in the mix. Now, I hope no Christian here goes to the horoscope or all this stuff and, and accesses the wisdom of astrologers. Do you realize in the Bible that it condemns that kind of activity? So, well, I'm a Leo. I'm a, I'm a Capricorn. So what? If you belong to Jesus, you shouldn't be belonging to any of that stuff. The stars don't predict your future. God guides your future. In Deuteronomy 4.19, he says, you shall not worship the host of heaven. You know, when we get into astrology, we're acting like he has God-like power over us. He says, I've given this to the nations as their inheritance, but not for my people. And so astrology is incompatible with God's system of knowledge. And so are any other kinds of magic, talking to the dead, and all the wise men were part of that club. To solve the problem, he brought these people in. That was his first frame of reference. They can help me. He called them to him to tell him what he had just dreamed and also to tell him what it meant. Have you ever had a dream you couldn't remember? Anybody here? What was it? You can't remember, can you? Now, that's, that's a tough I mean, it's hard enough to remember a dream you can't remember, but to ask somebody else. Now, that may have been what was happening here, or he may have remembered the dream. He just didn't tell them because he wanted the certainty of knowing that the interpretation would be true because if they could read his mind, he would know that the interpretation had godlike force. So it could be the latter. We don't know for sure. In verse 4, the wise men told the king to live forever. Now that was good politics. Whenever you come to a king, he's asking something crazy of you. Tell me the dream. Tell me what's in my head. They say, oh, king, live a long time. Live forever. But it did, this only made him mad. Then the king said, you tell, no, excuse me, they said to the king, you tell us the dream, and then, and that's the big word, then, we will tell you the interpretation. All right, come on, king, just tell us what you're thinking. The king said, nope, good try, but you die. You got to tell me the dream first, and then I will know that you have the right answer, and the right interpretation will naturally follow. That will verify the interpretation. And if you don't do it my way, I'm going to rip you apart limb from limb, get a new set of wise men, make the, the, your death look awful messy, and I'm going to start over with a brand new bunch of really good wise men. But if you do pull it off, that's the good side. 
I'm going to make you rich beyond your imagination and powerful in the kingdom. Are you optimistic that you can pull it off? Uh, they tried a second time to persuade the king, and King Nebuchadnezzar answered them again with clarity and force in verses 8 and 9. The king answered, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is sure that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. Now, why are they trying to gain time? It's very clear in the context. They're trying to figure out how to take this king out. If they can get rid of the king, they can get rid of the challenge of having to die because he is fixed in what he wants. So what does it mean when Nebuchadnezzar said that you are waiting for the times to change? Take your Bibles, turn to Daniel 2, verses 20 and 21. Right in the chapter, we have an answer. Daniel said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. And then it tells you what it means in the next phrase. He removes kings and sets up kings. So when you change times and seasons, you take a king out and you put a new king in. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar meant. He says, look, you are waiting for the times to change. When the times change, kings change. And that means you are waiting for me to die. You are buying time so I can die. I figured you out. You are corrupt wise men, all of you. You're a pack of liars to the lot. And you're trying to kill me for your future. Huh. The British Museum contains a tablet from ancient Assyria that, from the library of Ashurbanipal, but it's a Babylonian ta tablet. It came from the land of Babylon. And no doubt these wise men had access to this tablet. The tablet is called the Dream Tablet. It talks about the dead helping the living to understand dreams. And for the most part, the dream tablet tells a person how to not mess up in interpreting their dream. It was their version of Sigmund Freud and dream analysis. On line 20F, and that's the line I want to focus in because most of it's nonsense, and this one here is just outright awful. On line 20F, the dream tablet warns the dreamer not to look to heaven for answers, but to stick to the earth for a solution. How do you like that? If you have a dream, you want to interpret it, don't bother engaging heaven. Stick to the earth. The tablet reads, if he looks toward the heaven, there will, be, there, will be, there will be his undoing. If he looked toward the earth, he will be blessed. So if he looks up for an answer, forget it. But if he looks to the earth, well, maybe you can figure it out. And so the Chaldeans answered King Nebuchadnezzar with their pessimistic cosmic view of heaven codified in the dream tablet. Daniel 2, verses 10 and 11. The Chaldeans answer the king, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanted or Chaldean. Verse 11. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and none can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Now, they're not saying the gods are going to help you. They're saying the gods are not going to help you. That, look, we can't do it here, and definitely, and, and the gods are able, but they don't do that. They don't interact with people. They don't solve people's problems. Reality check, king. Come on, put your hand here. Pulse. King, uh, get, get the blood pressure cut for the king. King, hear me? Hear me carefully. I'm speaking as a wise man. We don't worship gods who care about us. Did you hear me, king? We don't worship gods who care about you. The gods don't care about you, king. They don't care about your kingdom. They don't care about your people. And they don't care enough to interpret your dream. They got the power, but they don't live around us. They're up there. They're not down here. Sorry to inform you. So why are you asking us to figure out a dream that's in your head and that's no concern of the gods? Isn't that a cold way to have a religion? Imagine a religion like that. They aren't going to help you or us because they don't care about you or us, us little ants here on earth and our little ant hills. You build a ziggurat mound mountain, you, you build this towering temple, it's just an ant hill of the gods. The king got angry, and you can see why. He sentenced all the wise men of Babylon to death. You're over, you're toast, you're finished. And when the death decree went out, Daniel's friends were on the list. Why? Because they had become wise men in Daniel chapter 1 because they passed the test. And when Ariok came to Daniel to kill him, God gave Daniel discretion to slow things down a bit. Daniel asked to come before the king to ask for time to figure it out. And so Ariok let him go in. He said, king, give me time. Slow down. Let's see if we can get the answers here. And the king gave him some time. Then Daniel went to his house. 
And he called his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, to pray. Do we know anyone named Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah? Are those common names today? They're very uncommon names. I haven't heard of a single person named after them. Uh, lots of Daniels out there, but do we have any Daniels here? Any Daniels? No Daniels in church today. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, but these are uncommon names. So he, he called them together to pray. It's because Daniel didn't think he could figure it out on his own. He knew he needed to pray so God would lead him into prophecy and help him to figure it out. In Daniel's day and our day, we can learn from this, that getting an answer to this question was a life and death matter. If they didn't figure out what the prophecy was about, the dream, they were going to die. Dear heart, let me just tell you something. If we don't pay attention and engage the prophecies correctly... We will not be in a right relationship with the Lord at the time of the end. God has given us the prophecies so we will know the signs of the times. Our lives will be arranged in an order with Christ and we will have access to the gospel of peace and we will be in a right standing with God when Jesus returns. And so how important is prophecy? It's a life and death matter and Daniel went to his knees about it. Let's look at these men's names. I have a slide here on the screen. Hananiah, which is hard to read, on your screen, it's, it's the Lord Yahweh is gracious to me. That's a great name. Mishael's name means who is what God is. Of course, we know the law of God is what God is, his character. Azariah's name means the Lord is my helper or the Lord my helper. That's the kind of friends you need in life who lift you up to the greatness of their names in prayer. When I was a young person, before I became a Christian, I hung out with bad folk who dragged me down. When I became a Christian, I started hanging out with people who would lift me up. And I, I asked God to help me be like that so I would lift them up too. So Daniel and his friends, four young men, praying on their knees to understand a dream they, they don't even know what it is. When they got finished praying with Daniel, Daniel's dreams, the same dream vision, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed in a vision of the night. What went through his head is now going directly through Daniel's head. And we often call it Nebuchadnezzar's dream, don't we? That was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. But it was also Daniel's vision of the night, which means his dream. So they both had the same dream. It's Daniel's dream and Nebuchadnezzar's dream. They dreamed it together. And, be, and before he does anything else, when he knows that he has it, that God has revealed it to him, of course he tells his friends, but then he starts praising God because God has opened the prophecies so he can understand them. Daniel gives God the full credit for making known the dream and its meaning. In, verse, in fact, I've been in an advanced scholarly committee on prophecy. And it's funny what scholars can sometimes do. They can act like it takes a very smart person to figure out the deeper questions, and the rest of us will never have a chance at figuring it out. I find it to be an awful interaction when that happens. Do you think the Lord Jesus might pass somebody by with a Ph.D.? who's not winning souls, who's not walking with God, and reveal his truth to someone with a third grade education who loves the Lord, who's praying, and who's studying the Bible for answers. Which one do you think God will give his answers to? Uh, the third grader, that's right. And so Jesus says, I thank thee, Father of heaven and earth, that you have taken these things and hidden them from the wise, and you have revealed them to babes. Yea, Father, for such was thy gracious will. And he says, all you who are weak and weary and heavy laden, come unto me. So Jesus is the answer. Christ will reveal his secrets to those who seek it on their knees. Verse 23, he says, To thee, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for thou hast given me wisdom and strength, and hast made known to me what, was at, what we asked of thee, for thou hast made known to us the king's matter or word. Daniel's God cares about Daniel. Daniel's God cares about the king. And Daniel's God cares about the wise men of Babylon too. Daniel's God is a relevant God who values the lives of his people. He values the lives of unbelievers so that prophecy can be used to help save them. He saved Daniel and his friends and the wise men together as he met the need of the king by revealing prophecy. Now Daniel 2 and you is the theme here. Why? Because the prophecy according to Daniel is for the latter days. So he didn't just do it for their good. He did it for our good. Then Daniel went into Arioch and told him not to destroy the wise men of Babylon. That was the first thing he said. So what was first and foremost on his mind? Not his life, not his three friends, but these unbelievers. Save their lives. Give them a chance to interact with the truth. Would you say that Daniel is an evangelist? Very much so. 
And then Arioch went into the king, and this is what Arioch said. He said, I have found a man who can make known the interpretation. King, I have found a man. I mean, I, I'm sure he said it dramatically, let it roll off his lips. Now, he probably wanted a promotion in the kingdom. He probably got it. But he didn't find a man. God called a man. The king asked Daniel in his Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, are you able to reveal the dream and make known its interpretation? Daniel, Daniel's answer no doubt made Arioch draw up in fear like a prune. Yeah, tell him you can do it. Please tell him you can do it, Daniel. Are you able? Tell him yes. Daniel was not the answer man for the king. Daniel said, nope, not me, but God. And so Arioch's kind of, hmm. Daniel 2.27, Daniel answered the king, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery which the king has asked. Now, if you're looking to these things in your life, if you're going to the wise men of the world, the philosopher kings of the planet, who think they know everything through deistic or theistic or just plain old evolution, and they warp the scripture, or, or they consult astrology books, or they go get card readers, or palm readers, or spiritualists, and the like. You can't get a single answer from God that way. Verse 28, but there is a God in heaven. Forget the dream book. Forget the tablet. It says they don't care up there. There's a God who cares. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be, and notice what it says, in the latter days. That's our time. Your dream and the vision of your head as you lay in bed are these. No, suddenly I'm highly engaged. He's talking not to Nebuchadnezzar. He's talking to me. I'm living in the latter days. Daniel gives the credit to God, just like he did in his prayer to God. Daniel's life is proof that we don't figure out prophecy because we're smart or because we have a PhD or because we are a church leader or we've had Greek or Hebrew. No. God gives his answers to those who seek him on their knees. That's how they got it. So how many of you want to understand Bible prophecy? Okay, get the book of Daniel open and pray. Start reading through it and praying and get into a small group and pray with others like Daniel did. Many a scholar will miss the deep truths of prophecy while a humble saint in a prayer group on their knees will understand Bible prophecy. In the study of prophecy, we don't figure things out for ourselves. I want to share a personal testimony. I was struggling for years with chiastic analysis in the book of Daniel. I almost quit. I came to a point one night when I was in tears in prayer with God. I said, God, I see patterns, but I can't close the gaps to where the structures are clean. I'm missing something, and I'm not smart enough to figure it out. And the first thing that went through my mind was, Mike, think about your sins a little bit and, and make sure you've humbled yourself before God. And so I spent the whole night, I, I, I started praying, then weeping into the night. And as the morning came, I felt the answer. It's a little complicated to share it with you, but I was able to close those gaps up. And it was the breakthrough in my research that has allowed me to continue on today and what I'm doing behind the scenes. I can testify that we don't figure things out. God reveals the secrets to us when we're on our knees. In the study of prophecy, we need Jesus. In the study of prophecy, we need the Holy Spirit. God comes to us and we're humble. Frederick von Schlegel once wrote that this story is a prophet looking backwards. Well, friends, Daniel is a prophet looking forwards. And that is a harder thing to do. He saw the history of the world as it would be without error. Centuries in advance. Daniel takes the king outright. Tells the king outright. He tells the king outright that the great God of heaven has made known to the king what will happen when? In the latter days. It just so happens that we are living in the latter days. The dream is really about Daniel 2 and you. In verse 30, Daniel tells the king that God wants him to know the thoughts of his mind. Now, let me ask you all a pertinent question. How many of you feel a little hot? Is the temperature okay? Now, I know it's cooler over here than it is over there. So if you're warm and you're doing this thing, that's the place to sit. But I think we need to bump it down a degree. I'm looking at faces out there. I don't want you to melt. So we'll, let, we'll bump it down one degree. It'll take a little time for it to kick in. In verse 30, Daniel tells the king that God wants him to know the thoughts of his mind. Peace of mind matters to God for the king. 
O king, get over that troubled mind and fearful spirit and give your life to God. So when you study prophecy right and God is in the mix, you get peace of mind out of it. Daniel then shared with the king his own dream that they shared together from God. Look at verse 29. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be hereafter. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. I get shivers when I read that verse. Verse 30. But as for me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living has this mystery been revealed to me, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Look, I'm not great. I'm not stellar. God loves you. He used me to love you. Verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold a great image. This image, mighty and exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of the image was of fine gold, its breast and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand. It smote the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image become, became a great mountain and it filled the whole earth. Wow! In those few words, he's described the entire history of the world. The whole history of the world in that dream of a metallic man with a golden head, the chest of silver, the waist of bronze, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay, from Daniel's day to the end. It's right there. Boom. The dream. And have you ever gone to school and they've given you 100 pages to memorize? What? How many of you do good memorizing 100 pages before you take the exam? You say, no way. Well, you know, I used to, way back when I was in seminary, be able to memorize 100, 200 pages before an exam. I had a great memory. After my pastorate in this area, I lost a lot of that memory. And uh, I have to work with concepts more than I do memory. But I could look at something. I could visualize it. Now, when I'm writing my sermon, you'll see what I'm doing here. I write it in, in yellow. See yellow? And I underline it because I have dyslexia. I do it because I'm visual. But I used to be able to, when I did this long enough over something, I could actually close my eyes and scroll down through the document. But not today. Maybe I don't study as hard as I did back then. But you know what? You don't have to have all that. You just got to have the Bible in front of you, getting on your knees, and God reveals his stuff to us. And he's given us in this short piece of scripture, not a hundred pages, but enough to figure it out. The dream in Daniel 2 reaches from Daniel's day to the time of the end. Verses 36 and 38. This was the dream, and now we will tell the king its interpretation. Verse 37. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and unto, into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell the sons of men, the beasts of the field, and that could mean also other kingdoms, and the birds of the air, that might mean angelic visitation as well, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Now, birds, he would actually rule over the birds, but birds in the book of Daniel also represent watchers. So there's a little nuance there. The Neo Babylon Empire founded by Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC is this head of gold. It was followed by the Silver Kingdom, inferior to the Golden Kingdom of Babylon, and then a kingdom of bronze, still more inferior to the silver and the gold. Although the kingdoms that follow are inferior in wealth and splendor, they become stronger as you near the end. Gold, silver, bronze, iron, iron and clay, iron at the end. World kingdoms become stronger but inferior as we come to the end of days. Daniel 2.39 And after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. So he's moving through history here. In Daniel 5.28, Daniel told Belshazzar, the last king of Babylon, that your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. He died that night. He was in a drunken feast. He was profaning the tabernacle treasures of the temple. And God took him out and his kingdom in a single night. The Medo-Persians, under the leadership of Cyrus and Darius, Cyrus dried up the river Euphrates. The great bronze bars that were sunk down into the mud were up that night. And they went through it, opened the door, took the city, killed the king a single night, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah hundreds of years before. Years later, the silver kingdom of Medo-Persia fell to the Greeks 
who were led by Alexander the Great with his bronze shield. Now, by the way, that happened in 539 B.C. Alexander the Great, with his, in his con, uh, context, the bronze shields and the bronze warfare and all that, October 1, 331 B.C., at the Battle of Arbella, he takes out the Medo-Persian Empire. Daniel 8 describes the victory of Alexander the Great in detail in chapter 8. When Alexander was conquering Palestine, he had just taken out Tyre, built this large ramp into the Mediterranean. As he was coming down to destroy the city of Jerusalem, destroy the temple, we, Josephus, who's a historian at the time of Christ, shortly after, tells us that the high priest, most likely Jadua, was standing at the door and was standing right there and welcomed him into the city. And then he opened to him, took him into the temple, and he opened him the scroll of the prophet Daniel and took him to what we call Daniel chapter 8, and he showed him that he would conquer the world. Alexander spared Jerusalem, he spared the temple, and he went on about his business. Prophecy protected the people of God at that time. And so we have, a, we have an ancient source to this. Then the fourth king of iron broke in pieces the others. Altogether, as Rome conquered the entire Greek world that Alexander the Great had conquered and unified, and thus the bronze kingdom of Greece fell to the iron kingdom of Rome in the third Macedonian war at the battle of Piedna in 168 BC when Antiochus III the Great learned that he wasn't great anymore because he was taken out by Rome. Daniel 240, and there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things and like iron which crushes it shall break and crush all these. And then Daniel moves on to the time of the toes. The toes and the feet have iron them also but not all iron. In some way, the iron of Rome goes to the end. You have Rome in the legs, you have Rome in the toes, but you have mud at the end. Rome transitioned from the iron kingdom of the Roman emperors to the divided Rome of the nations of Europe in the Middle Ages. Now, by the way, do we have any young people here who like to, you like to play in the mud? Uh-oh, your mama's sitting there, right? Eh, a little bit. I'll tell you, I still like to play in the mud. When I go fishing, I get into the mud. I can just jump into the water and clean off. I like being in the mud. Now, when we were at Cedar Ridge years ago, my boys would get in the mud right there in those stormwater ponds, and they'd have to be caught at the door of the church. Don't you come in. You'll bring all that stuff in. And Diana was interacting with some folks that wanted them to stop. She says, well, you know, I don't want them being so straight-laced. They hate church, so let's just not say anything today. And a lot of kids came to church. We want them clean and stuff, but sometimes kids like playing in the mud. But mud is unstable. Clay is unstable. It doesn't have strength to it. Rome transitioned from the Iron King of the Roman emperors to the divided Rome of the nations of Europe in the Middle Ages. The last emperor of Rome, who was just a boy king, does anybody know his name here? He's named after the first, uh, he's the, the first king of Rome and also the greatest king of Rome. His name is Romulus Augustulus. He was a boy king. He was removed from the throne of the Roman emperors by hero like King Ottavasser in the year 476 AD. That's when the Rome of the emperors ends and you have the divided Rome that follows. Same kingdom according to the Bible. And the kingdom of Europe was a divided kingdom afterwards, held together by two forces, the church and the state. The church and the state. Daniel 241. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. This description in Daniel describes the Europe of the Middle Ages perfectly. Strong and weak, a divided kingdom, Rome transitioning. The Bible doesn't teach that Rome fell. It teaches that it transitioned to the divided Rome of Europe of the Middle Ages. Daniel calls this second phase of the fourth kingdom a kingdom in verse 41, a divided kingdom. That means the fourth kingdom of iron transitions in its second phase as the fourth kingdom into a divided kingdom of iron and clay. Now clay is dirt. When you dry it up, it becomes dust. The image ends with iron and dirt. Dirt. A dirt kingdom. You know, Johnny Cash sang a song just before he died talking about everything he's achieved in life. He got it from some group called Something Nails. I can't remember the name of the group right now. Something Nine Nails or something. But, but, the, name, but the, the song was about how everything he has done was a kingdom of dirt. Maybe Daniel 2 is in mind. 
Clay is dirt. The image ends with iron, strength, but dirt. History calls the divided phase of the kingdom, the Holy Roman Empire, that was Europe held together in the Middle Ages by a monarch that kind of held the, the, the people together politically and the Pope of Rome who held them together religiously. Two leaders and not one is a divided kingdom. That's what the Holy Roman Empire was. One leader for the state and one for the church. It was a fragile mix, a miry mix of church craft and state craft that wouldn't work very well forever. Daniel then shows us how the kings of Europe would try to fix this miry mix and mess that could hardly hold together on its own. They would try to make it work. They attempted to unite Europe by royal family marriages. He said they would mingle the seed of men. In the 1800s, that attempt was, occurred after Napoleon tried to conquer Europe and unify it. He met his Waterloo. They said, look, we got to get people <clears throat> we got to get kings and queens related to each other. <clears throat> and so he had them interacting by marriage. Daniel 2, 43. <clears throat> and as you saw, the iron mixed with miry clay, <clears throat> so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And that brings us to the 1800s when they're intermarrying to hold Europe together. When World War I hit in 1914, the monarchs of Europe were all kin to each other by marriage or blood ties. And so World War I was a big family feud like the Hatfields and the McCoys. Four major royal dynastic families came down at the end of World War I. The Habsburgs that ruled Austria, Bohemia, Hungary, and Spain. The Hohenzollerns that had ruled Germany and Prussia, the Romanovs that had ruled Russia, the Ottoman Turks that had ruled the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, and the Middle East. You had kings on thrones who would pass the throne to their children until World War I. And World War I, the historical monarchies end. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, one of the Habsburgs, was assassinated in 1914 in Sarajevo, and that started World War I. After the war's end, at the signing of the Treaty of Versailles on June 28, 1919, Europe had largely abandoned these monarchies. So you're not living in the time of the kings anymore. You have the kingdoms, but not the kings. It moved from kings over kingdoms to social democracies, dictatorships, or communist power states like the Soviet Union that would arise, ruled by foolish kind of people with bad economics. Our world moves from the era of kings to the era of kingdoms in the toes of the feet. Now, we're not living in the days of the kings. We're living in the days of the kingdoms. Daniel predicted <clears throat> that the blood mixing would utterly fail to unite Europe and the world, and so it did fail. And we are living in a mess today that led to World War I, World War II, the, 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 the instability of the world and the Cold War, because there is nothing to hold the world together. The last kingdom is the fifth kingdom, and it is not of this world. And that's the one I want to focus on. Number five is famous in the Bible. What, what does the number ten represent? You can help me with this. What does number ten represent? What does it point to in the Bible? Famous ten. Ten commandments. What does number five point to in the Bible? The, what? Well, the fifth commandment, love your father and your, your, honor your father and your mother. But what's it famous for? The Remember the two loaves, the, the two fishes and the five loaves? And the word of God is symbolized by bread. Now the books of Moses, how many do we have? Five. And the, and the Bible calls it the Torah. Five is the number for the Torah. This is the fifth kingdom. What does that mean? It means it's the Torah kingdom. It's the word of God kingdom. It's the kingdom built upon God's truth, his order. The word of God kingdom is the fifth and final kingdom. The Torah kingdom, thank goodness, it comes in the latter days. That's the one that follows the mess of the image. In the Bible, a mountain represents a kingdom. Now, I, I don't think we can appreciate a Torah kingdom unless we appreciate the Torah and the Word of God in our hand, right? If a Torah kingdom exists in heaven, it better matter here. In the Bible, a mountain represents a kingdom. And that's what it moves from the image to a mountain. In Isaiah 2, 1 to 5, the mountain of God is the house of God, the sanctuary of God, his kingdom. Hebrews 12, 22 says the heavenly Jerusalem is Mount Zion in heaven. Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar saw a mountain kingdom in heaven give birth to a stone kingdom. Something happened up there where that mountain, a stone was cut out of it. He saw that stone fly through space, collide with the image, and the feet where you bow down and worship at the image. Meaning end time events are over worship, an image, an idol, as opposed to the rock that comes from heaven, from God's eternal kingdom. 
Friends, we are living in those kingdom days without bloodline kings. And Daniel told the king in Daniel 2 that this time is the time of the end, the latter days, that transition. The vision is for our time, Daniel 2, and you is what matters here. In the vision, in the dream, the stone comes from a heavenly kingdom. It collides with the feet of the image where pagans worship idols. The stone is cut out of a heavenly kingdom, mountain. The stone flies through space. It collides with the image in the days of the kingdoms. But it's set up in the days of the kings. Something happens in heaven just before the end of the historical monarchy. Something happens before this transition in the days of the kings. The stone that is the fifth kingdom, the Torah kingdom, a heavenly event occurs that precedes this stone colliding with the image. And the cutting out of that stone is in fact the judgment depicted in Daniel 7. It's the end of the 2300 days in Daniel 8.14. So in a sense, the fifth kingdom, the Torah kingdom, is the kingdom of heaven come near and here that has been around for a long time that is founded upon the word of God. In the book of Revelation, it says there are loud voices in heaven, the seventh trumpet. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of the Lord and of his Christ. Something happens there that will matter here. Daniel 2.44, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms. The kingdom is set up in heaven first, then it breaks in pieces the kingdoms. And it brings them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Verse 45, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be hereafter. The dream is certain, its interpretation sure. The fifth kingdom, the Torah kingdom, is set up in heaven in the days of those kings. So do we have kings after World War I or before? I went through a great deal of effort to kind of tell you when they end. The historical monarch is in World War I. So for this to be true, when would the kingdom of God be set up in heaven? Before World War I. We're looking to the 1800s. Something happens in heaven prior to World War I. And that kingdom that is set up will come at the time of the end to destroy the world. You see, you have all of Bible prophecy right here in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 7, 8, and so on. That brings us to the 19th century, the rise of nationalism, the divided mess we live in today that follows. The kingdom event in heaven that establishes the last and fifth kingdom is not here, it's there. It's set up there. The stone is cut out of a mountain there before the collapse of the historical monarchies in the days of those kings. Jesus alluded to this kingdom as his kingdom because he's the rock of ages his, he, and his kingdom is not of this world he told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. I don't get it here. Jesus made this point clear in his parable introduced in Luke 19, 11, 12. Open your Bibles with me. Let's look at that. Now Jesus can use two verses to capture all of Daniel 2 because Jesus is smart and Jesus is God. Now as they heard these things, he, Jesus, proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed, and what are they supposing in the verse there? They suppose what? That what? The king of God was to appear when? Right there in the days of the iron legs. Rome. Now look at verse 2, verse 12. Jesus said, he said therefore, a nobleman went where? Into a far off country to do what? To receive a kingdom and then return. So before he returns, what has he got to do in that far off country? Receive his kingdom. Does he receive his kingdom here or there? See, so receiving his kingdom is a heavenly event. Jesus went to heaven when he ascended as the nobleman of the parable. He endured the centuries of the Middle Ages for the judgment of Daniel 7 when he came before the Ancient of Days after the end of the Middle Ages in heaven. And the transition from the old to the new order to modernism at the time of the French Revolution, thereabouts, to receive his kingdom in the 1800s. The longest time prophecy of the Bible, the 2300 year prophecy, runs out in the year 1844. And Jesus Christ, according to Daniel 7, came before God Almighty in the heavenly sanctuary. He entered the most holy place where the throne of God is at in the heavenly sanctuary in Daniel 7. He was carried in a cloud of smoke like the high priest enters on the day of atonement. And the Bible says to him was given a kingdom, 
that all nations, kindreds, tribes, and tongues should serve him. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom which shall not be destroyed. A dominion will never pass away. So Christ is saying, I'm leaving here. I'll be gone for a while. And when that event occurs in heaven, right after that, I'm coming back. That's Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8. Jesus did not set up his kingdom in the days of the fourth kingdom of Rome. As the nobleman in the parable, Jesus went into that far off country of heaven to receive his kingdom at the end of the Middle Ages. In the 1800s, the book of Daniel indicates in the year 1844, just before the end of the historical monarchies, and then he returns. Friends, we are living in the days just before the coming of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? We're living in the latter days. You can make all kinds of plans for your future. God's future is the one that's going to make it for you. Daniel 2 and you, we are living just before the end. Friend, Jesus is the stone king of a stone kingdom because Jesus is the rock of ages. Peter said, come to him, that living stone, precious in God's eyes, rejected by men. Living stones, be yourself built up in a spiritual house. Friend, one day the coming of Jesus will destroy the world kingdom image. It will destroy every nation on the face of the earth. It will mean the end of human history as we know it. It will be a cataclysmic final end. Paul says Christ comes in flaming fire with his holy angels. And vengeance will be inflicted upon those who attack God's people, who attack God's word. And our link to the future is Jesus. Our link to the future is a stone kingdom is a kingdom founded on something solid, rock solid in our life. This world, destined to be destroyed, will be reborn one day to become the center of the universe because Jesus lived here. Jesus died here. Jesus pled and prayed and bled for us here on the cross. As for the image, the wind blew it away because it's just an image of a man, a human, man-made system of metal and dirt that's broken and blown away at the time of the end. So which kingdom do you want to belong to? I want to belong to a stone kingdom, the stone kingdom. The stone is the son of man. In Hebrew, the word stone is eben. The word son is ben. It's a word play. Stone, son, word play. I want to be a part of the son of man, stone kingdom, the kingdom of God, the Torah kingdom, the fifth kingdom. Daniel 2 and you invokes a question for you to answer. Here's the question. Which kingdom do you belong to in Daniel 2 and you? Which kingdom do you really belong to right now? When you do a moral assessment in your own life, where are your loyalties? When Jesus comes, which kingdom will have your heart, your affections, your loyalty? Where are you now with that? This old rotten world of ours is an idle kingdom made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, clay that breaks down and blows away in the end. In the end, it's just power and mud because there's nothing that will last forever in the stone kingdom. When Nebuchadnezzar heard the interpretation, he got it right, sort of. I mean, he's moving in the right way. He bowed down to Daniel, bad idea. But he acknowledged the God of heaven on his knees, a good idea. So he got half of it right. And that second part, that's how you become a part of the stone kingdom. When you're on your knees, you get down on your knees, and you recognize that God is sovereign in your life, that you need his direction. You can't fix your sins without him. That you need his forgiveness. You need his sustaining power. You need his grace and peace that Paul talks about, and you need his purpose, him to be Lord of your life. When you do that, you enter the stone kingdom. No proud king and no proud person in any kingdom will enter the kingdom of God without prayer and humility on their knees. You get to God and his kingdom on your knees. That's how Daniel got the meaning of the dream. They got on their knees and they prayed, and God gave it to them. And that is what Nebuchadnezzar did when he understood its meaning right. He got on his knees. That's how we get there. Today I challenge you to come to Jesus, the living stone, the precious cornerstone, and get on your knees and figure out Daniel 2 and you in prayer with God and Jesus in the mix on your knees. Friend, God is waiting there for you to come to him in humility, to kneel, to commit your life to Jesus, maybe for the first time or maybe again. We have to do that every day in a way. Start the day on your knees. And there, the great God of heaven will bend down to you because, yes, he cares. The great God of heaven is, is interested in you on planet Earth. He comes to you. And you will enter a kingdom of his son, the living stone, the Torah kingdom. And you'll never die because you'll live for God for, out, for ages and ages to come. And life will be sweet as honey. Every day, every morning, better than next. 
again and again and again and again and again. The stone kingdom, the Torah kingdom, forever and ever. Daniel 2, 46 to 48. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, did homage to Daniel, and commanded an offering, incense be offered up to him. Bad idea there. But then he got this right. The king said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. My name is Pastor Michael Oxentanko, and we're just so happy that you're checking into our sermon content at Reaching Hearts SDA Church on YouTube. I want to really encourage you to hit the subscribe button. If you want more of our preaching, teaching, just go to the playlist and, and you'll see it laid out there. Again, thank you so much for being a part of our gospel preaching, teaching ministry.